terms of the origin here, uh, it actually goes back to our first space that I could that I could not remember if we recorded or not. But we did not record the first one we did of these. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think so. But then I was trying to find in our own like in our personal chat history the awesome idea that you had to record it, and I couldn't find it. Was that over? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you attribute that to me. Well, um, certainly, I mean, you did have like the tweet storm of like the 27 step process that you have to take to record this. Like, oh, how could I? Well, how could I not yeah, attribute I mean, that, it to you? Oh, you know what? What precipitated it was I think we were so fired up for whichever, you know, whatever topic we had for the first one, we decided we had to record it. And being the dope that I am, I thought it was going to be no problem because all I do is like plug one old phone into a computer. I mean, how like, hard can it you, be? Right. How, right. I mean, I just, I just hold one tape, uh, you know, recorder up to the tape player and, you know, copy the tape that way. Um, but yeah, it's hard. Well, I'm really glad you did. So, and then of course <laughs> I, th- these recordings are so valuable that I was really trying to find the recording from that first Twitter space because so if you recall, and this just has to be in your in your memory because we have a recording of it, we <laughs> we talked with the oxide compensation model in that we ended up talking about that, and someone mentioned whose name I don't think we have oh. that next had done the same thing that the, oh that's right that's right that's right I do remember that, that the, so the next computer company had paid everyone a flat seventy five k all engineers, which of course I immediately had lots of follow-up questions in part because I, at Oxide we pay and we will link to the blog entry, but we pay everybody $180,000, 180 to um, which is basically what 75 K was in 1985. I'm not sure if you've done that math, Adam. I, I had not done that math. I was just, I was just, Thinking, I get one eighty two fifty. Oh, cool! I just know yeah. that. Yeah, we got a race. I should read the blog. Yeah, you, you, you should, you should read the blog. The bottom of the blog list. We all got a race. Oh, good. Yeah, it was nice. I, that was at the end of last year. But the, but I, I found that to be almost like chilling that they basically next had come to the same conclusion, but then it had all gone horribly wrong, and I really wanted to understand why. So I got this book, Steve Jobs and the Next Big Thing from Randall Strauss, copyright 1993. So just to give a quick next primer, and I'm hoping that there are, are folks that, if there are folks here, by the way, who worked with Next or an exposure to Next, definitely want to hear from lots of other folks on this. But the quick next primer, Steve Jobs leaves Apple, Apple in 1985. Next is bought back by Apple in 1996. So it's 13 years. It's pretty long. And Mm -hmm. um, the, what I did not, I just didn't really think about next. I don't think because by the time I was coming up next was kind of, was very clearly struggling and then pivoted away from hardware entirely. But here's the thing I was really not braced for. So I had recommended this book. Basically we had this weird space. The book looks good. I buy the book. I also recommend it to CJ who joined us at Oxide Adam. And because CJ was CJ Mendez was asking for like I want I want to read some interesting books, and so he I did this thing that I try not to do too frequently where I was recommending a book that I myself had not yet read because you never know how that's going to go. Totally. And CJ was like, "Man, I really I loved Steve Jobs and the Next Big Thing," and you're like, "You're right." Like I learned a lot about Sun from that book, <laughs> and I'm like, "What do you mean you learned about what?" And. This book is, I swear, the best early history of Sun Microsystems. And in fact, basically the entire book contrasts next to Sun. So the, and with a couple of just amazingly big reveals, at least for me personally. So, and Tom, you're here. I'm hoping you, I'm going to get you to speak because I've got a burning, I, I am really wondering about this because uh, the Spark Station One was Sun Four C, right, Adam? Right, correct. And do you know what the C stands for? No, no idea. Okay, so I did know this: the C stands for Campus, and it was called Campus. Okay. And so the architecture was called Campus. 
I did not know why it was called campus. I've just never known. And Tom, do you know why it's called campus? Tom is going to be on mute. I'm sure Tom does know why it's called campus, but I did not. Right. Yeah, here I am. Um, yeah, and Andy actually started a separate company to go after the education market. And that's what that's what Steve Jobs and Next were doing. And I think that's partly why Andy wanted to go there. That's exactly it. And I, and, yeah. Uh, and the rest of the son was like, ah, who needs education? Until, you know, until Andy came out with the specs for the campus. And I was like, oh, this is a killer machine. <laughs> So they rolled it back into Tom. So they rolled it back into Sun. Yeah. So I guess, and Tom, obviously, I should have asked you that earlier because I, it was always a little bit of a strange code name, Campus, and it's because Next was targeting higher ed, like the, the market that they were going to go after was higher education, which, as a point that this book makes repeatedly, makes no sense. Like higher education, not really a. I mean we all know from our own university departments, like it's not like there's a lot of extra money sloshing around in higher education, although it feels like there should be with what tuition costs, but it's a very strange market to go after. Well, it's I funny mean, because, because a lot of Sun's earliest sales were also to that market. It was to the uh, scientists and engineers and university types who were all the, the forefront of the Unix stuff. That's right. And Sun was, and Tom, I'd love to get your take on this, but definitely Strauss's take is that Sun was winning that market without having to try very hard. That it was it was just kind of a consequence of winning the workstation market. Sun was winning also the academic workstation market. And Next was focused really only on that market with a machine that was pretty underpowered. Is it, so, Tom, what was your impression of Next at the time? Um, as soon as we found out what it really was, we were all like, oh, that's not competitive. I mean, the <laughs> hardware was really, really lackluster, but damn it, it sure looked good. It, it did um, look, know, so, yeah. So it was the Steve Jobs reality distortion feel. It was like, oh, this is so cool, but just don't try to use it for anything. <laughs> That's very concise. And and when you say look good, just to be clear, you're talking about like the the physicality yeah. of the machine. Right, right. The, the design, industrial design. The industrial design, which in this and, thing... And, and, the, and the UI. The UI was great. Right. But, you know, but it wasn't Unix underneath. Not quite. It wasn't. And the so the the in the book is is just loaded with with Steve Jobs isms about the so he, they wanted the the black paint on this 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 one foot by one foot cube, which they felt had to be exactly one foot by one foot for reasons that aren't really clear. I'm not sure. <laughs> Tom, was that did that have more of a meaning? In, I I mean I remember like the cube. I just don't know why they thought that was the right form factor. It's a very weird decision. And yeah, the, uh, I don't know. But, uh, well, and they contrasted to the pizza box, to the Sun pizza box being a, like a, a, in some ways, as rigid a form factor, but at a much more, uh, it seems to make a lot more sense. Um, all right, so, so the, it, it, on the, like the black paint on this thing, I mean, this is like, it feels like such a classic Steve Jobs that like they are having, they want to have no seams on the outside of, of, of this cube. And so they end up uh, casting it um, with, I want to say like magnesium, although that doesn't make sense now that I'm saying it. But they, they basically, they, 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 the cube is casted as a single unit without any seams, and then they had to find the right paint that wouldn't. It was just like, it's nuts how much time and energy they spent on the look of it. Well, the other, th the other thing that's nuts is they spend a huge amount of money on the factory to produce these things. Right. So yeah, what do you remember about the factory? they were going to be pump pumping out hundreds of thousands. Uh, really just that they were building a huge factory. And it was like, oh, really? It was about the time that people were starting to outsource everything. Yeah, and this is a point that, that so, Strauss makes it, it as well, that Sun was not, was very deliberately outsourcing manufacturing. Um, and 
uh, Jobs had decided to manufacture absolutely everything. Uh, that next would manufacture absolutely everything, which made really – did that make sense at the time, Tom? That makes no sense now. It sounds like – Well, know. you know, Apple, <laughs> Apple kind of uh, was doing some of that too. You know, so, so for super high volume and, and quality control, it kind of makes sense. But there was, there was no way next was going to get to that kind of volume. And uh, Sun was doing incremental things and – Steve was just trying to, you know, do the hundred yard it, it, pass or whatever. Yeah, the kind of the hail mary, and it, there was. It, it is amazing just the total lack of market focus, like total misunderstanding of what the market is. Next does not know who they're selling to. Very, very confused about who they're selling to, and they think that like. They decide, and Tom, tell me if this term rings a bell. They decide that like Sun is dominating the worst workstation market, and they clearly can't compete with the Mac in the personal computer market because the thing is too expensive. So Adam, they had targeted a three thousand dollar price point for this thing, and they're coming in at like ten, yeah. which is a miss. <laughs> I mean, it so- sounds like the, the Lisa all over again, not the Apple II or the Mac. It is a Lisa all over again. I mean, no, I think you're right. I think it is a Lisa all over again, except without any, uh, but, but like worse in many ways. And, right. and it, it, so the thing is, I mean, they don't know. So they decide, okay, it's too expensive for that kind of that personal computing demographic. We're not competitive with Sun and Tom and crew are like rolling their eyes at, the, at, at how uh, underpowered this thing is. So we are going to go into the the personal workstation market, a market that they invent. The problem is that there is no personal workstation market at that time. <laughs> so it's, uh, it it does not go well. Well, you well you can tell you know Steve Jobs never never understood the power of networking either. Interesting. And uh, he has this quote I saw saw somewhere about how the next computer was so that. Some Stanford du- student can cure cancer in his dorm room, <laughs> and it's like, what? well, okay. What about the other ten thousand computers on campus? Couldn't they help? Oh, okay, so Tom, this is actually a very good. You're making. I mean, yeah, this is just dead on because they talk about this over and over again. Where Next refuses to interoperate with anything, so they have this idea that the, a Next customer is going to buy all Next machines. Um, and they do convince, I think, poor, was it Drexel University? They do convince one university to go all in next <laughs> um, before. But the, I, with, with, like, with Berkeley, for example, they really wanted to get Berkeley to run next. And Berkeley's like, we've got, we've got 2,000 Sun machines here. Like, we're not going to. And then we've got a bunch of other workstations, too. It's not just the Sun machines. Like, you're going to have to interoperate. So, Tom, it sounds like the, the, at Sun, that was accepted as a constraint. I mean, obviously, the network is the computer. You understood that, like you had to interoperate with other things. Right. And we made, we made good money doing that, you know, with all these interoperability products. Well, well that's the, you know, another point that they, they make a lot is that Next was a really proprietary company. This is like not a deep, this is not a deep thought at all, but it, where it's really contrasted to Sun being very much an open company and, uh, working with, and so they, in particular, Tom, they call out the creation of the Spark clone market by Sun deliberately, like licensing Spark designs to create Spark clones, which I always view as kind of a non-event, but um, I guess it, it, it gave customers assurance that they were not getting a proprietary solution. Yeah, and it was kind of a, a hope that, that there would be some market Sun didn't discover that would help the volume of all the Spark stuff. And, and so, Brian, Brian, course, after, I, nothing Brian that. after I saw your tweet today, I read the introduction to the book. And one of the things that I, I found really interesting was the the Jobs, Gates, Microsoft, Next dynamic. And so did, to what degree did the, did the book go into depth on that? Uh, they do go into depth. I mean, where, I mean, uh, Bill Gates um, volunteers that he would gladly urinate on a Next machine, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> apparently verbatim. Uh, um <laughs> They are because I mean they are attempting to reinvent absolutely everything. So they need all software to be written from scratch, effectively, and they are really struggling to convince Microsoft to port anything to it. So a big part of Next is going around to these like software vendors and basically lying to them about the size about 
next performance um, where they are basically, I mean, they're engaged in all sorts of things where they're, they're channel stuffing and all kind of all sorts of like similar, similar misdeeds to convince software vendors that there was going to be a big market there. And so that plays a big role. Microsoft itself does not play a big role because I don't think it was like close for Microsoft. I think Microsoft is just like, no. <laughs> well, Brian, did you, did you read the, the introduction? Uh, cause there, there was the great anecdote where Bill Gates shows up for a meeting with jobs and jobs makes him wait and like walks around the office and kind of parades around making a show of talking to everyone except for him. Uh, like thumbing his nose as hard as he could at the, the partner who, it turns out he needed most. He, he did. And so that is, I would say, part of a larger theme of, and Jobs says this over and over and over again at Next, he does things to make Next look bigger than it is. Hmm. And so my inference from that, which Gates recounted as well, is that that was not, although maybe it was, all, maybe it was a twofer, it was also an act of personal domination, but it's as much to be like, I actually don't need Microsoft that much. And in a way to look like more important than Microsoft. And he does this over and over and over and over again. I mean, it's it, over and over. You're just like, good God, can you just like stop being a dick for like 30 seconds? And it, it, he has like a, a meeting with, um, with IBM. And this is in later Next when uh, he had licensed, Next had licensed Next Step to IBM. They desperately needed IBM's support. Um, and they needed IBM basically to re-up their license because he, he had managed to convince IBM to license Next Step software, but no future versions of Next Step software. So it's like, oh, well, I, oh yeah, no, I'm sorry. If you want like the next version, like that's a different, that's a whole different thing. That's Next Step 2.0. <laughs> so he is going to go out to present to 900 people at IBM. And this is like, Adam, this is like the IBM analog of the Bill Gates story. There are 900 people who are going to, he's going to present to in Dallas. Uh, he has demanded there are two slide projectors for this presentation. And there is only one slide projector available. The next exec who's basically going to go out there with him knows this and is trying to figure out when do I explain to Steve that there's only one slide projector, not two, because I know he's going to flip his shit when he finds this out. So, he's like, so he has the idea of like, I'm going to wait until we're on. I, I, it's like, I actually, do I wait until we're on the plane or I tell him before we get on the plane? He's like, you know what? I'm going to tell him before we get on the plane. That way he can really think about how he's going to change his presentation to accommodate the fact there's only one slide projector. So they're at the airport. He tells him this. Job says, I need two slide projectors. And if I don't have two slide projectors, it's not worth my time. And he goes home. And... The, and there are like 900 IBM execs waiting to hear. And so this guy then flies out by himself to present to, to these 900 execs who keep waiting for like, when does Steve Jobs come out? You're like, no, Steve Jobs is not coming out. Steve, <laughs> Steve Jobs is at home because you don't have a second slide projector. And which is just like insane. I think to anybody that that – has ever, I mean, like, how do you, anyway, it, it, so he, Adam, to, to answer your question, like, he does that a lot, and it's not, it's not clear what he could possibly be thinking, but he does try to make the company look really, really big and important, and one of the, way he, the ways he does it is by treating people really badly, <laughs> which is... Sounds like Gary killed all over again. <laughs> no, right, exactly, right? I mean, I feel, I feel like that, that early... Computing is littered with a lot of these kind of personalities that are that try to like abuse people into uh, into cooperating with them, which I don't think that really works. I mean, so, so Brian, I don't. I, well, there there is a lot of software companies that bought bought the vision from Next. I remember uh, being very jealous about. I think uh, Mathematica went whole hog. Mathematica on Next. did go whole hog on Next, and. and Instead of fun, and, and we had worked with them early on, and then they went. Became... That's interesting. So I think actually, Tom, Mathematica stands as really an exception here, in the, at least in the book. Did you talk about Mathematica? Mathematica was definitely one of the. So I actually did have that question from the book because they talk about Mathematica on Next. So Mathematica was not then on other workstations, it was effectively only on Next. I believe so for the first. Year or two. Yeah, wow. Well, that would be consistent with the book. So that's that is a, a surprising decision. Well, clearly they came to their own realization that like that market was not going to be uh, as big as they had been led to believe. Yeah. 
Adam, have you ever seen a Next Cube? We actually had one in my high school. What? Yeah. Um, so we had a bunch of we had a we had a Vax VMS we had, and we had a Next Cube uh, at my high school. So did you program the Next Cube? No, I I I mean, so this was. Uh, uh, no, so I didn't program it myself. I like I. It was in some back room. I sat down at it once. Um, definitely did not like do anything more than like click around at a few things, and it sort of. I remember everyone sort of regarding it as a beautiful, useless piece of machinery. That is a very accurate, I think, assessment. Especially th- this is now when you're there. This is circa like mid '90s, right? '95. This is like after they yeah. stopped making hardware. Yeah, so I graduated from, so it was probably, uh, yeah, like 94, 95. I, th- I think Steve Jobs would count that as a win. Yeah, beautiful. That's, beautiful. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right, that's what mattered, right. Well, the, it actually, in one episode that's related in the book, helped to explain, so my own introduction to Steve Jobs, I never met him, but my own, like, glancing blow with him was I was over at a friend's house. It, I, this is growing up, this is in the er, very early 90s. And uh, her uh, dad was being screamed at in the next room over the speakerphone. And I kind of shot her a look like, that. God, that's like, what's going on there? She's like, no, it's fine. It's Steve Jobs. This happens a lot. I'm like, Steve Jobs yells at your dad a lot? Uh, and as it turns out, and this, is, and this is actually related to the book, her dad is Fred Ebrahimi, who was at the time the CEO of Quark, which made Quark Express. And Tom Mathematica was on the net on next, but they, they, he could not convince Quark to port Quark Express to, to next. And, um, and so he, the book talks about like him berating Ebrahimi. I'm like, Hey, I think I'm on the other, I think, I think there's a, there's a young, confused Brian Cantrell at the other end of that call. Uh, the, the, and you know, he is like, you know, he is, you know, using basically slurs of, of, of Ebrahimi's national origin. It's just like, it's really, but that, did, that tactic did not work for a quirk, as it turns out. It turns out that that worked very poorly. So, well, Brian, yeah. you, you, Brian, you know this, the story of Steve Jobs trying to sell uh, next machines to the Brown Computer Science Department. I do not know the story. Oh, this is great. So there was, there was this bake-off. And it was like Next, Sun, and Deck. And I think it was like uh, Tom Deppner, the systems professor, uh, advocating for Sun. Steve Rice, um, the, uh, I guess, uh, programming languages, programming environments professor, um, advocating for Deck. And then Andy Van Dam, legend of computer graphics, advocating for, for Next. And then John Savage, the head of the department. Um, <laughs> advocating for peace. Well, <laughs> that's right. But then... Apparently, having a confrontation with Steve Jobs, uh, where he where he basically said, you know, your your product looks great, I'm just not so sure your company is going to be around uh, for as long as we need it to be, uh, and then Steve Jobs calling him an asshole and storming out. So th- that's very on. That's very consistent. I have to say, with the, that that anecdote would would slot right in with many just like it in this book because a lot of people do question Next's viability. And Steve Jobs does not deal with that very well. That question is not. Um, the other thing is, in order to kind of convince people that it was viable, he next spent very freely. So they were very lavish in their offices. They were very lavish in like having things catered, and which is needless to say, <laughs> when when money is short. Uh, this might not be the best way to. I, I'm not sure if it ever convinced anyone of their viability, but it definitely shortened their runway. Well, that was that was very. I was reading the Wikipedia page, which, by the way, uh, one of the pieces they they said seventy five thousand dollars a year for all the employees up to some point, and then it dropped down to fifty thousand. So, you, so you had like managers making uh, less than the people reporting to them, and and, and weird things like that. But the. Um, not that that is weird in itself, but but uh, you know weird inversions like that. Um, but the other thing they said was like Ansel Adams prints everywhere and IMP architecture and just just crazy. But but the but money, I mean money was pretty easy to come by. Weirdly enough, I think at least venture money, not customer money. So no, that, this is what the book goes into in terms of like the number. Like they went from crisis to crisis to crisis. They got Ross Perot. I mean, he did not take VC money. He had weird money from beginning to end. 
So it's Ross Perot, who and they think like we got basically an unlimited check from Ross Perot, which was t- true until they spent all of it. And then Ross Perot is very uh, – he thought Steve Jobs was a total genius and then realized that he was – whether he was a total genius or not, he wasn't selling any computers. Um, the And then they get Canon – to the, to pony up a huge check. So I think Canon, I want to say, puts in like 100 million bucks. And then Canon ends up being really pot committed. And ironically, Ross Perot got into Next in part because of like some anti-Japanese American nationalism coming out of Jobs. And Tom, I'd be interested to know, if, if, I mean, certainly I remember this kind of zeitgeist as a kid when, you know, Rockefeller Center had been bought by a Japanese holding company and people were very, there's a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment in the U.S. But Jobs tacked right into that with an American computer company not making something in Japan. Yeah, the 80s were all about fear of Japan. Totally. How do you thread that needle, though, between Canon <laughs> And anti-Japanese sentiment. Like, well, glad you asked. And that's exactly, and that's exactly the needle needs a thread. And then Canon, especially when uh, Canon wants to start pushing for manufacturing to be done offshore, basically. Yeah, no, it's a total needle to thread. And this is what he, yeah. he he does thread these needles though over and over and over again, and uses this kind of star power to. A man, managed to get that kind of that that next round of funding, but ultimately they did. Like ultimately, they had to pivot away from hardware and they had to get get rid of the manufacturing line that that Tom described. And so, Tom, but this is, the thing that's interesting about this is all of this stuff is used in the book in contrast to what Sun was doing at the same time. So, uh-huh. and certainly, like I viewed Sun as like a, I mean, I think it was like. I, I, Sun did not feel lavish from a spending on employees. I don't think it felt like cheap, but I don't know, Adam, what do you, what did you think? I felt, felt like, I mean, they, they, they took away our donuts on Wednesday mornings. So, <laughs> that's so, right. so I would not say yeah. it's lavish. Yeah. And, yeah. McNeely doesn't do lavish. I also, I mean, I didn't feel like, the, I don't feel like it was like an Amazon like point of making, you know, of like making people work on like doors on saw, saw horses to uh, like, I mean, you because Bezos had this idea of like really telling people and doing lots of things that were really like taking frugal to an extreme. I don't think Sun took frugal to an extreme, but it was not no. lavish. No, totally. It was. Yeah. It didn't make you work in weird conditions. Um, but but also, yeah. What, I mean, it looked actually the the other the other fun bit of history is when when Sun was occupying Building One on the Mountain View campus across the pond and in what became building five was metaphor computer systems, <laughs> which is a whole company you should look at the history of, but they were lavish. So we'd look over there as like, wow, nice furniture. Oh, what's that? Another party. And <laughs> very different. Interesting. Uh, well, so, so here's something that, that it, Tom, that I really want your take on. And I, I, I tweeted this um, day before yesterday because I thought it, it was so, Interesting, but because this again, the the book and Tommy, you you've not read this book, right? I like, uh, yeah, I, I think no, no. I'd love to get your take on it. Um, although it's telling you a bunch of the well, stuff that you already know, but it's or you're confirming a bunch of things that it's saying. But the because it does talk about Sun so much, they actually the, the um, Strauss actually calls out why he feels that Sun does not actually, he says the, the, the Sun variant deserves more attention than it is received. Measured by most, any yardstick that one could choose, Sun was most one of the most successful companies, stories of the 1980s and for all industrial America. And he says that uh, in Sun, we have the, the, the makings of a terrific tale, which by now should be part of American folklore, by now being 1993, it's actually pre-internet, which is kind of funny, or pre-eternal September anyway. Yet its story is relatively unknown because its founders are not obsessively self-aggrandizing like Steve Jobs or Lee Iacocca or Donald Trump, uh, because they freely share credit among themselves, which means there's no single Herculean hero. Which I, I mean, I don't know if I want to accuse Vinod Kosla of being like uh, of of low ego, but maybe that is a fair characterization. Tom, what, what do you make of that? Well, I think they all had high ego, except except maybe Scott, but just it wasn't turned turned that direction in terms of self aggrandizement. Self aggrandizement. Um, but you know, Andy and Bill and Vinod all like 
Or are all forces? They are all forces. But you know, as I was kind of reflecting that, I'm like, and I totally agree with you. These are not like low ego individuals, although with, maybe with the exception of Scott, I, I totally agree with that. You know, the, it, some culturally, the uh, with the with some exception of Bill Joy and Java, there was not really a culture of people claiming work, claiming credit for the work of others. We didn't. And a suspension of reality, right? I mean, I think there was there was typically uh, an, uh, a, a realization of, of of actual events going on around us, which which seems you know absent in next certainly. You actually, Adam, that's a pretty good point in terms of like there is no there's no McNeely distortion field. Um, that's right. Yeah, I definitely certainly. I Tom, I don't know what your take is. I I certainly agree with that. Yeah. Um, people are pretty grounded and certainly the uh it's, anyway, i thought that was interesting i thought it was an interesting take about like maybe you know maybe we shouldn't be waiting for a book on sun because it's not going to happen because there's they, there was no mythos that was created as part of it you know maybe that's the not not that the company should have had its own steve jobs but i, I think it's kind of an, it's it's an interesting take on why maybe it's underreported yeah there i mean Sun had amazing characters, so it, it could be a great movie <laughs> right. or something. But uh, like John Gage, oh, oh my God! Do, do you know John I Gage? I do, I do, and uh, I, although I've not seen him in in, in years, but John, have you, you meet John Gage, Adam? He, yeah, I did around the around the Oracle acquisition actually, because d- didn't he go to Oracle? God, he ah, uh, did he? He is spell. He is spellbinding. Know. He's someone who I felt was very. Uh, I don't know, Tom, what your take is on John, but I always felt him to be a great storyteller for sure. Well, he he knew every scientist, rock star, politician, and news person on the planet, hmm. and he, he was just one of these connecting nodes of everybody, and always had amazing stories and. Yeah, just because he was at Sun, Sun, Sun became interesting to huge numbers of people. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, so he left what, in 2008, according to, to Wikipedia anyway, um, and uh, then went to, to VC, of course, like any, like any self-respecting former Sun exec, I guess. Tom Lyon accepted. <laughs> um, so the, the other thing I, that, I, that was interesting in terms of like the the technical contributions of next um because that i've i mean i don't, I don't know i've adam I, like did you spend any time with with next step i tried to install it once and it was very slow but i didn't not with next step like only with the sort of um early versions of mac os 10 like the pre-release versions that that had not yet kind of shed the vestigial next step components um, and, and kind of take it on its its full fully realized Mac OS form, uh, but it was it was only kind of briefly in that period. Okay, so did you read this uh, this Objective C Hopple paper? I did. I did read that. I did read that. Okay, have you written any Objective C? So I'm gonna I'm gonna say basically no, but I've written like a teeny bit just because I needed to interact with some components of Mac OS, but like I'm, I'm not fluent at all. I don't claim to understand any of the idiosyncrasies of it. Yeah. I mean, I've written no objective C um, and other, and I've always been kind of like, I don't know, t- curious, but I've also also viewed it as like having, I mean, it's basically a, it's C and small talk together, which doesn't seem like it can end well, but, um, so this, oh, Adam, what'd you make of the Hopple paper? Well, so I, I, it's hard to, to not read that Hopple paper kind of playing back an alternate history. And I was wondering about, about the, the book as well. Like if Apple does not acquire next, if Apple, you know, cheaps out and acquires B instead, and I know there's lots of what ifs, but but like, does does next matter? And certainly, no. does Objective C matter? Like, uh, you know, the the Hopple paper talks about, you know, the customers and the market, but really lands on Next as the only folks using this thing in anger. So if if Next drops to irrelevance, or or if you know the stars don't line up for the iPhone and so forth, like, does does a, you know, how much do we care about Objective C? 
and I think it was hard for me but, to read well, that, and, with, read the paper without that thought in the back of my head, which was like, you know, it, it, it all fell on th this one event. I had similar thoughts about the mock microkernel. I mean, after all these years, has it actually made a difference? Yeah, I think you're both right. I think that, that both of those these technologies are in a vessel that has that survives despite the odds because that by the time they're acquired in 1996 i personally had forgotten about next and i think like just forgotten that they were alive at all i mean i think the company was in very dire straits and the the, the when i actually went back and just reread the chapter on that on the acquisition of next in the isaacson biography just kind of want to remind myself of that. And the, the, it, what Isaacson says anyway, the, biogra the biography of Steve Jobs, is that Emilio was basically told, whichever company you buy, that's going to be the future CEO of Apple. And Emilio really did not like Jean-Louis Gasset. Apparently hated Gasset more than he hated Jobs. And Jobs also hates Gasset. And Ga Gasset, I think, feels more ambivalently, ambivalently about uh, about jobs than jobs feels about Gasset. But, the, but I was amazed that after having read this biography of Next effectively, the Isaacson biogra biography of jobs damn near doesn't talk about Next. He talks about the founding of Next, and then he talks about the acquisition of Next by Apple and does not talk about the intervening 13 years at all. Well, well that's what the introduction does such a great job of, that somehow Next was always a company that was two years old, even when it was eight years old the press would write about it like it was, you know, up, these up-and-comers, give them a break. They've only been around a couple of years. Why would they have any product or have sold any product? Uh, that, that's right. That's right. It was a, 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 he was just, yeah, masterful at that, about kind of being perpetually young, which, of course, although, but in, so in the end, and the answer to your question, at least from my perspective, is, yeah, I don't know that Objective-C makes it at all if Next perishes in 1996. I'd love to get someone else's take on that, but I, I, I don't think it's the, and the paper itself, did you find it awkward that two of the authors of the paper <laughs> are, are, yes, yeah, are, 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 are talking about themselves in the third person and their great accomplishments. Uh, and, and I think that probably the way it played out is that uh, Sue was interviewing Cox and Neroff, right? So they weren't necessarily writing these these statements about themselves necessarily, mm. but um, w w which I don't know, maybe that's too generous, but I think took some of the edge off of it for me. But you know, when they, you know, if, if, uh, if I wrote a biography, if you and I got together and wrote, wrote the biography of observability and described ourselves as legends of tracing, you know, I'd, I'd feel like that was maybe a little much, maybe a little much. Well, how about, do you like when they have, uh, totally different beliefs about why this company PPI, which renamed itself to Stepstone, the board or orders itself to rename itself because it's, what is it? Personal productivity incorporated or whatever it is. And they're like, no, no yeah. you have to rename yourself. It's like, okay, we'll be Stepstone. Like, I don't know. Maybe we'll go back to PPI. Like, how about, can we can do a little bit better than that? Oh, well, and you have Neroff who was the employee uh, describing um, some of the actions of Cox, the executive, <laughs> And how like the they got a bunch of investors, and the investors you know insisted on getting a new CEO. It's like that's a story. I'm sorry, you can't just gloss over that. You can't just say, well, that's that's just a normal thing that happens. Like that that's reflective of some really deep misgivings. Oh, they're definitely deep misgivings. And I like the line again. This is like one co-author talking about another. Cox concerned himself with doing his own research, but collaborated only minimally with the development staff, treating his job somewhat like an oh. academic appointment. I'm like. Isn't he a, he's a, wait a minute, like the, the, I, the same Cox that co-authored the paper? I've, I have the exact same like line underlined with a star next to it. And I just wrote, wow. So yes, I agree. It, it was, I mean, and I'm like, are, you know, I've, I've not that I've read a ton of Hopple papers, but I don't think Hopple papers spill the tea to quite this much. I mean, this is. No. And, and there, there's, there's the bit about how, you know, uh, object-oriented programming and GUI are are basically interchangeable terms, and it's like, 
you know, I, I get that, you know, early on that, that OOP was a very useful paradigm for some of these object oriented, but just, I don't know, it felt, it, it felt like a lot. It felt like they were making a lot of, of very bold claims, uh, demeaning a bunch of other languages, like disparaging C++ and Java for having uh, parameters, so, for lacking the ability to name parameters. They um, make a big deal about that. And I, oh. yeah, what do you think about it? Because I, I kind of, I view yep. the name parameters as actually a bit of a, 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 a bit of an anti-pattern, actually. I'm sure that and if folks disagree, like hop in here if you, but I think name parameters can be kind of a gateway drug to functions that are really hard to reason about. Well, I get it. When you think about, when you think about small talk as this message passing where the ordering of components of that message might be independent, I think it may make sense in, as you sort of narrow the focus there. But, but I, I did think it was interesting, and I was wondering how triggering this was for you, Brian, that they described um, <laughs> Objective-C as a soldering iron uh, meant to connect these other components rather than, um, I, I guess, rather than the language that everything would necessarily be built, of, built in, you know, in and of itself. I will tell you that was not triggering. Do you think that's triggering for me? Are you are we are we making fun of the fact of my poor soldering ability, or is this what this is about? I am. How much time do we have left? You know, I, I, mean, I, right. I am getting better at soldering slowly, and I'm injuring myself less. <laughs> um, my only my only attempt with Objective C was looking at doing a dr uh, drivers in Mac OS. It's like. I get there, I was like, oh my God, why the hell did they do this to the kernel? That is a very good question. And so, and this is where I do think that, Adam, the part that was triggering for me was, and just Tom, to your, your observation that they're doing this in the kernel, the, the part that was triggering to me was all these references to the software crisis. Oh, yeah. That was really interesting. I, I, I need to go dive into this, but the software crisis being that software is rising in importance and that kind of software is unbuildable through a confluence of being able to find enough programmers, enough programmers of enough quality and being able to manage the process. Also programmers are shitheads. Don't forget that. Like there's a, there's a, uh, like the, like this often justified such programmers, high salaries and contributed to their sense of unmanageability. Like that yeah. sentence was triggering for me because uh, uh, yeah, the fact that they, these were correlated too, <laughs> right? The more productive a software engineer might be, like the, the like more unmanageable they were, they also are. Exactly. And, and the, 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 the kind of like entitled prima donnas and the hardware is the real thing. And the, the software, and it, it, it did remind me that this was a really, this was a prevailing zeitgeist in this era yeah. where, and but, but you know, the, 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 the way that those two things can be true is if, Managers are trying to do the wrong thing. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. It's like we would be a lot more manageable if managers were trying to do the right thing a little more frequently, by the way. Uh, yeah, no, that's exactly <laughs> right. And well, I also, so, so Tom, I would love your take on this, especially because I'll tell you, Adam, in reading that, the, I was reminded about that, oh, yeah, the software crisis. And like, we are not going to be able to build software is this idea that like software is becoming so complicated and it takes so long and so many of these things run over budget. And to me, the thing that broke the back of that was actually open source. Hmm. And the not, you know, so people had this idea that like object orientation would break the back of that and you would have these, you know, th these software ICs, as they called it here, software integrated circuits. And, you know, one of the things that one of the authors of the paper wanted to do was charge only $300 for the compiler, but then $30,000 each for the libraries effectively. And that makes software on that would make software unbuilt. I mean, if you can imagine, if we if we were deprived of all open source software right now, we would would be kind of back in a very different era. And they they talk in the paper about how that's an unviable model. They talk in the paper about how taking some component, like assembling a bunch of components that you're soldering together, is unviable because. Like if there are bugs in those components, they are unfixable. If there are design flaws in those components, it's unfixable. Yes. Uh, and like so, there's this dichotomy of the 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 raison d'être of Objective C being also invalidated by the market concerns that they describe. And one of the things that was so interesting in here, bring it back to next, 
was this description of how, how PPI was building these software ICs, these, these ostensibly reusable components across different operating systems and environments. And the, they weren't that good. And the, ones who were, the, the folks who were building them, the, the good ones, was next because they were also using them. And I think this, this harkens back to a theme that we've talked about a lot of times on these spaces of like using the things that you're making and like building a framework without actually building a use case for it will mean that that framework kind of sucks. Yes, and part of the, the feuding couple element of this paper is Naroff and Cox, two of the authors, disagree over that role at PPI. Naroff has an opinion that, that because we weren't actually building anything real with this, Next was the one that was actually building real things, and they were the ones that were actually hitting the real issues, and PPI wasn't. Well, here's a great line. They say, thus, despite significant early problems with Objective C, next decision would ultimately pay off. How? <laughs> Walk me through that. They found because they about? bought the winning lottery ticket, they would not have bought that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I know that, that I, I can see that, that, that Rick is here. I know, Rick, you've actually dealt with Objective C in a way that certainly Adam and I have not. Um, I would love to know your take on to what degree Objective C achieved its kind of aim of composability, because that's kind of the big question. Yeah, I mean, I I wrote a lot of Objective C um, during my time at, time at Apple, and like, there's there's certain aspects of it that carried through and and were really really nice. Um, like the way it m works into a UI framework, definitely there's there's a lot of nice um, fit there for a lot of the dynamicism. You, you don't know exactly what message you're sending to. And as long as you have the correct interface, it's all good. And you you can create a UI infrastructure, which is kind of how Next Step made it work, uh, where you can do things like entirely switch out a theming layer or an implementate like large implementation in a fairly seamless way. That said, there's a lot of not-so-nice not parts about Objective-C with, like, there's, there used to be a, a routine exercise of searching SDKs for the longest Objective-C method names. Oh, no. And I just pulled up a list right now oh, from no. 2010 <laughs> where in 2010, the longest method name found... Now, this is method name. This does not include the class name. The method name was 202 characters long. Right, because because ultimately, when you consider what's happening, named parameters actually become part of the method name, oh. and that string, that whole string, so that the base name of the method, which is really the parameter for, or the the name of the first parameter, um, is all appended together, and then that is actually what's issued down into Objective C message send for the actual function dispatch. So imagine that you're you're dispatching like your 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 equivalent of a C plus plus V table is actually you taking a two hundred and two character string somehow hashing that and then you know dispatching based on that. That's what actually happens internally in the language, which means that you know when when we we're writing performance analysis tools, obc message send is the name of the method would often turn up, which basically just meant you're making a lot of Objective C method calls, Interesting. and that was usually an indication that you had made a mistake. Because everyone knew that if you got into any sort of performance critical code or where you're doing any sort of tight loop, that the actual message dispatch cost was way too high. Um, this led to a lot of you know hybrids where the C part was used for writing the high performance aspects, and then the objective C was to provide a nice uh, interface into the rest of the ecosystem. Um, we did this in like the symbol lookup libraries, where you actually have a large data structure. You're mostly doing small operations and, and searching through data structures, um, you can do all that in C very cleanly and then box it up and hand it back in an Objective-C wrapper, which is fairly lightweight. Yeah, interesting. Um, it also led to the even stranger world of Objective-C++. They talk about Objective-C++ in here. I had not heard of Objective-C++ until this paper. Okay, yeah, so did you have to use Objective-C++ at all? We did. Um, so, so one of the things that we ended up making was a dictionary that mapped ranges, so like address ranges, to objects. And, and you can imagine why this would be useful in like a debugger performance analysis 
case, right? Totally. Like yeah, you're, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're looking up, you're trying to do queries of what symbol is this address, right? But you wanted the info, like the wrapper of Objective C for hooking into larger parts of, of the infrastructure and like the UI uh, pieces. But the implementation needed to be fast. And so that ultimately, I had a coworker who wrote a wrapper that then used C++ STL, it's like um, map class to, or the, the map template to implement an actual range-based dictionary lookup. And so that kind of stuff was pretty common where people would bring in you know, existing C and C++ platforms and just wrap it with enough Objective C to make the UI interactions work. Interesting. Uh, well, so, so in a lot of ways, yeah. like while it worked well as a UI framework, it that's kind of where it stayed, and uh, most people just treated it as like a, a necessary evil. Well, and so they it, performance is very much a non-goal for Objective C, which they make clear in this awful paper. They do not. They. Um, are I mean it's a, it's a they view it as an Objective C C hybrid or small talk C hybrid, and they're much more concerned about the composability of software than they are about its performance. Which I think Rick gets to exactly that's exactly your experience. It's like com composability pretty good, performance pretty bad. So you have to be careful about the way you construct the hybrid. And it, it, I mean it's it's I don't know Adam I'm sure you had the same reaction reading this. It's really impossible not to think about Rust as it kind of delivering it all here and allowing us to get it all. Yeah, well, I mean, Swift, I, is, Swift is also a really yes, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because that's that's the logical su successor to Objective-C. And in a lot of ways, it, it delivers more on the performance side while providing some of the niceties of the Objective-C kind of goals. But they had to go about it in a wildly different way, right? The idea of applying small talk to this just does not work at the performance that they wanted. Right. They actually talk about, so they do talk, definitely talk about Swift and kind of Swift inheriting kind of the mantle of that. They also, Adam, did you find strange the kind of the comment that Neroff hired Latner um, yes. at Apple? But then he goes out of his way to point out that he then reported to Latner later. I was, it was like, there's a lot of like organizational like ephemera the, in this paper. <laughs> like, absolutely. There's a lot of weird like, uh, like, <laughs> it's called, like mute, like self-reflexive Wikipedia editing. It felt like on some of this stuff. Which, like I don't, I don't care what your org chart was. I don't know. Like it, 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 it did feel like it went out of its way to to name drop some to of these name drop, I know, but it's, um, and it yeah. also felt like a, a sort of a mixed opinion about Swift. Like that that Swift sort of you know was was taking the mantle, but unfortunately, you know, really the Swift idioms looked nothing like Objective C idioms. Uh, so it, it seemed a little mirthful, almost. I mean, or a little, little regretful, almost, on, on some of these things. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, interesting. And, yeah, sorry. And, and any any mention of like bringing in Latner for Swift is sort of missing a big piece of the the actual history, which was that uh, Latner and the LLVM folks were really brought up as interesting for an alternative compiler infrastructure because Apple had gotten in their head that GPL three was going to be a terrible thing. And they needed to excise anything that would be potentially GPL three, and then much later, Swift came about. Oh, interesting! Yeah, they don't talk about the licensing at all. They do. They mention LLVM and Latner being brought in for LLVM, but not in the licensing context. I think it's really in the Objective C two point context um, before moving on to uh, to Swift. Uh, it would, Swift presumably would be the subject of its own Hoffle paper. So we'll get, I, I, I would imagine Swift seems to, to merit it. Of course, there's a, there has to be, I believe, a 10 year latency between uh, the, the, the things that are being described and the Hoffle paper, if memory serves. I have to say, like, having read this paper, I can see why. If, like, everyone is going to, like, just, just unload on their former colleagues, I guess you want to make, you know, the, the, the longer the latency, the better. We switched an interesting one just in that, like, you know, Apple is able to push, and, and the paper makes this, the Hopper paper on Objective-C makes this point that, be, you know, folks uh, flocked to Objective-C because of the introduction of the iPhone and the App Store. And so, um, you know, Swift will be significant. And, and again, one, one asked the question, um, you know, absent this necessity, you know, if, if it were an open ecosystem, would it, would it be as significant? 
Yeah, and it, well, and it's certainly certainly my takeaway from both the book and from honestly the Objective C story is just the uh, the importance of open source and and open not just open standards but actual like I mean I just think it's it, it is um, it's a big part of of both Next and Objective C was the the degree to which all of this was very proprietary. Um, which made it, I, I mean, the idea, because it, it feels to me that Objective-C, at least at PPI, is built as much around a proprietary software business model, even though they don't phrase it as such. Adam, is that a... It, yeah, profoundly. And and as I said, you know, it, it, it feels like this, you know, buried in here, it makes the case for open source and the necessity of open source um, in terms of assembling these these components. There was one uh, line that Rick in here that you would love where, I mean, love in the, uh, the guffaw at where they want to be to software what Intel is to hardware. It's like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, it just doesn't really surprise me. I mean, there, there's... I was I was at Apple at a very interesting stretch of history, right? I, I was there from like 2003, so started the end of PowerPC through 2009, which was just after iPad launched. Um, yeah, that's a real inflection point. There were there was always this divide between the Core OS group, which is kind of led by the former Next Step folks, who really had a view that the hardware didn't matter. If you, uh -huh. if you created good abstractions and you, you could basically do everything in software and, and the hardware folks were just there as a, a means to make the hardware or the software something that gets executed, but they shouldn't trouble themselves with any details. And the hardware folks, of course, were all, that's nonsense. Like we have to devote a huge amount of resources to make your software run well in order to hit performance targets, et cetera. And I mean, to be fair, I was right in the middle of this and that I was on in the Mac hardware group writing performance analysis tools. <laughs> right, so you're right on the cold face of it. Well, and, and that was as a response to the performance tools on the team on the core OS side, which had their own tools that refused to dip into the hardware. That's really interesting. Um, and, so, and, and so you could definitely still see those kind of those fracture lines from the next acquisition. Those folks are... I mean, is there, a, there a, a healthy group of folks coming from Next in that, or at least culturally? Um, I mean, there were definitely a lot of folks that in high, in sort of the leadership positions that had a lineage back through Next, and and uh, all the you know you have um, uh, some various folks from the mock community too that were very influential in how the system should work. Um, so well, one question I have for you on that on that note, Rick, is because the I, I mean I know Apple had secrecy as a a tradition when from before Jobs left. Next definitely quadruples down on secrecy and uses secrecy a lot, um, and in part because the truth was that Next wasn't doing very well as a company, wasn't selling very many, so they like necessarily there was a lot of secrecy. How much of that was culturally brought back to Apple? Do you think Apple got more secretive as a result of the next acquisition? Apple was always fairly secretive from what I heard, right? Like I, I got there well after many of these events. I can certainly say that at my time there, I would have to pass through one, two, three, Four, five different badge readers to get to my desk. <laughs> oh Jesus! Wow. Um, and around the time that iPhone started, they started doing NDAs per project. <laughs> so, <laughs> being on a hardware performance tools group, I had an NDA per project that my software was targeting, which was everything. Um. Is, is every and, engineer assigned their own lawyer to negotiate the NDAs they need with various projects? And how does this world work? Well, it, it actually leads to a very different cultural situation of um, you don't know what other projects your friends are working on. And so there, there was a whole, during my time there, there was a whole cultural aspect of negotiating a 
you know, let's sort of a negotiation protocol of which projects are we both disclosed on so that we can talk about something. <laughs> Without disclosing um, them, you always say you have to like you you have to describe them abstractly enough that you're not uh... right. I have learned that at some point since I left, this is now an internal tool where you just enter the other person's LDAP, and it comes back and tells you what projects you have in common. Um, so they I'm, have. Improved. I'm surprised they don't. I'm surprised they didn't learn from the uh, VFX world where you would have a code name for a project. So like, I worked on Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part One, but Internally, there was a code name, which was like extra time. So whenever we talked about it in public, we would be talking about extra time so people wouldn't know that we were working on, you know, Harry Potter. But for yours, you'd just be like, oh, yeah, are you working on extra time? I'm working on extra time. And then you'd know, right? Well, that was mostly the thing. Um, there was a long time where the Power, power Max were all, uh, you know, P and then a number. So P51, P67. Um, and, and that covered all the laptops and the desktops. But then as they got it into the Intel machines, those became the M's. And then the iPods became N's. And then some of the N's were actually iPhones. And you could guess what products were coming because of the pattern that they were using for assigning code names. And so that's where, you know, they created their own cultural problems by, you know. This is the thing about secrecy is so much work. <laughs> I, I was actually, I, 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 a couple of years ago, uh, I, I read a blog post about how, how Apple did all of that. Someone probably blog, blogged about it. And my first reaction was, this is so useless. Why would anybody ever need this in a company? And then maybe a couple of years passed by, and then the, uh, the NSA in Armenia asked me to run a project for them. But the deal was none of the army officers who were coding had to know what the project was. And my first reaction was, oh, okay, so this is where this could be ever handy. And, and for Apple, it's all about maintaining the secrecy of it so that you own the initial presentation of it. It was all about being able to walk on stage and dramatically drop something that was going to be life-changing in some way. So that, and Rick, I'd be really curious for you to read this This history of next because I, I have to say that like that is definitely like part of it for sure and maybe even like what jobs would claim is like it, it, it for that kind of pop but it really does feel like there's this darker side of it where uh the transparency is prevented to to kind of prolong this distortion field and get people to because in particular they would you know the way that jobs got people to a lot of hours out of jobs was by kind of creating crises and by also promising that, you know, there are these massive orders or they I mean, there are a lot of promises that were not actually backed up by facts. And it's hard to not see that the, the secrecy was being used to, to manipulate people at, at some level. Maybe, maybe not deliberately, although it feels pretty deliberate. I don't know. That may be too dark a read. Uh -huh. No, I, I think that'd be fair. I mean, to, to give some examples from my time there. So um, the x86 shift, uh, people had to be read in to that project. So you had to have your NDA. And one aspect of that was that they had set up an entirely separate organization to port the OF to x86. So like Darwin had always been ported to x86. And so that had been maintained for a very long time but the upper layers of the stack all had to be ported. And instead of just, you know, tasking the teams that owned various pieces of the infrastructure, um, they literally just set up a entirely parallel organization that was then charged with making a snapshot of the source repositories and working through the issues. And they were not allowed to talk with the original authors or the actual maintainers of those components. And that got them through up to the point of publicly announcing T1, the transition kits. Um, a similar thing happened for iPhone, where iPhone started as a project. They created an entire little parallel org. They made an entire copy of the build infrastructure and all the source co code repositories and just started hacking away at it. Um, it was very interesting for that one specifically because they came calling to my team 
three months after they had started right. because the tools were not working. Oh, well. right, right, exactly. It's all broken. It's like, what's all broken? Oh, the shadow it, thing that I created. Right, and it turned out that they had made copies of, of our code repositories and not really understanding the hardware aspects of it at all, commented out a bunch of things and basically, you know, disabled most of the functionality. But also what they didn't realize was that they had copied source code repositories that we had explicitly locked down because they were covered by third-party NDAs with processor vendors. And we never really got a resolution for that, but it was just like the, the need to create these parallel orgs, to have the secrecy, to drive folks for, you're building the next big thing and you're doing it in secret. And we're not even gonna read in the people that have the best knowledge of this. It certainly was around building a culture of like a, a small team is going to get this done. And once it's released, then we'll bring everybody else in and you'll get a break. Except that never happened. Well, and so I have to say one, another thing that, that is again over and over again in the, the book on jobs and at next is his oscillation between everything was either great or shit. And there's nothing, there's no kind of nuance in between. And I did laugh at the his uh, in the paper. Adam Jobs talks about Objective C, and it, I think he uh, he's like he he tells them to make it great um, because it's currently shit, uh, which I thought was very uh, very on brand. And then I love the fact that they've got this. Uh, yeah, he urged love to folks on making the core language great and to stop quote wasting time on the IC packages, the libraries. Um, I loved the, the Steve Jobs meeting had a profound impact on Neroff. His ability to articulate problems with Objective-C was impressive. Am I the only one that reads euphemism into that? <laughs> I, I, it, it, was, I, I, it was so weird. It was so weird because uh, it, it was so sycophantic, too, because he referred to him as, like, the CEO. And what was the other title he ascribed to him? Like, the, chief developer officer or something like the that. The CEA, the chief engineering advocate. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, I mean, this guy clearly got snowed by a person who, I mean, I, like all respect to Steve Jobs, but I, I, I doubt that he was getting down into the nitty gritty of, of like whatever Naroff found objectionable or, or great about Objective C. That's a, it'd be interesting to know. I, I get the sense that he is obviously not as technical, but is, but was that that didn't stop him from really weighing in on things. As certainly, I get from the at least from again from the the, the next book. Um, it does remind me of the, uh, the the Sun CTO Greg Papadopoulos described press once that he did. I don't know when he was describing because he was working with Gates a lot um, on the the Java integration with C Sharp, I guess. Um, and every time he met with Bill Gates is when Sun and, and Microsoft were definitely enemies. Gates would just berate him for some very small technical detail for like the first thirty minutes. <laughs> and he just had to like, I just have to kind of like let him go. And then you can like actually have a meeting, but he has to like, um, and I don't, I, it feels like jobs has the beration with not necessarily the, the, the same mastery of technical detail. Yeah. Um, well, I know we've been one. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I did want to ask, uh, since I'm out of topic a bit, is Objective-C being used today anywhere outside of the Apple-ish ecosystem? And uh, I assume also GNU step. I think the answer to that is broadly no, but I would is it, it would be hard to imagine because this this paper again was was so aggrandizing that it, it, that I, I'm not sure why they would have omitted a, a reference, however minor, to someone using it. <laughs> uh, is that is that unfair? I, I, mean, no, I, I it, it doesn't feel no, it doesn't feel too unfair. Although I, I do feel that like I mean Apple is certainly the I, I don't think it's broadly it is not used outside of of Apple. I, um, and GNU Step, I do not. I mean I remember I, I got GNU Step curious at some point but couldn't get it to work and that was the end of it. I don't know. And trying to give you I actually use GNU Step? I actually do because I do use Window Maker, uh, the the desktop environment on my free BSD machine. So I, I sometimes I even like write a couple of small Objective-C codes. You know, those are small things like, uh, what, what do they call it? Applets at, at, the, at the left or the right side of the screen. Uh, like uh, it could be like a duck that would start boiling when the CPU is too hot. Oh, right, right, right. Or, yeah, this is, like, this is like why people learn Tickle so they can interact with their EDA tooling. So um, yeah, you, well, you may be it. That, that, that may be the Objective-C usage outside of Apple. 
Maybe you make your your your, your 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 duck boil in in. <laughs> well, I know we want to keep this to about an hour. Um, um, thank you, everyone. Um, sorry to binge read this over the weekend. Um, definitely, it was a uh, I. It was a fun read, Theo. I, I saw you wanted to get in here. You want to? You want to give us some parting words? Theo may have actually tried to hang up on us and accidentally hit the request button. I don't know. Um, but um, Tom, oh, sorry, I'm here. I'm here. Th- yeah, th- I was. I, I was going to contribute that there is a significant population that does agent-based modeling using Objective C still. There we go. Agent-based modeling. The, 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 that community is alive and well with Objective-C. So uh, It's alive. It came <laughs> out of the University of New Mexico, um, but it still exists in some high, high-brow consulting companies that do like genetic, model, genetic algorithm modeling of business, um, business logistics and things. All right. Well, uh, the, 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 another place that one can take one's Objective-C uh, aptitude, I guess. Um, yeah. Co- cobalt, there, there you go. Right exactly. There. I'm sure it would all survive in perpetuity. I, the, um, but, uh, thank you very much, everyone, Tom. Thank you. Um, especially for being able to fact check some of the stuff about sun. Um, but I, uh, this, this was a lot of fun and, uh, we'll look forward to, to seeing y'all next week. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.